Welcome. If we take a mass and hang it by a nearly massless thread and set it into motion by displacing it a certain angle from vertical, it will continue to oscillate and looks like it's in simple harmonic motion. So we want to think about and analyze what is going on with this. So a good place to start is with forces. On this mass, we have, of course, a force of gravity. And then we have a tension. But if you try this at home, if you try this in your physics lab, and you hold this pendulum, you'll find that the tension is a little bit stronger at the bottom than it is at the top. And in fact, if you look at it a lot, you'll find that the tension is constantly changing as it moves along its path. So that's really bad because we hate changing forces, but we can think, if we think about it in terms of torques, right, the second law for torques, then we would have the torque from our gravity plus the torque from our tension over the moment of inertia is equal to the angular acceleration. Well, the torque from our gravity, our gra force of gravity is nice and constant. Everything's nice about that. Our tension, the torque from our tension is going to be zero because our radius, r, from this point to here is in the exact opposite direction as our tension. So the torque from our tension is zero because our tension is anti-parallel to our radius. So let's look just at our force of gravity then. Now that we don't have to worry about tension, so we can think of it from a couple different directions. Here we would have right perfectly vertical and then a couple of angles further out describing this line. And so here we have our force of gravity is going to be pointing perfectly down. And here, perfectly down the same amount, perfectly down the same amount. Well, if we continue this, then our r vector is going to look in this direction, in this direction, and our r vector in this direction. And whatever angle we have from the vertical, so this angle being theta, is also going to be this angle. This angle, we'll call this now phi, is going to be this angle. And if we have a positive angle in this direction, then our r cross f goes into page until it becomes zero. And now our r goes in the opposite direction, so we actually have to write r cross f is out. So it switches sign at zero angle. So for positive angle, it is going in one direction, at negative angle is going the other direction. In this positive angle, it's trying to have a torque bring us back to zero. For this negative angle, it has a torque trying to bring us back to zero. So our torque from gravity is going to be negative, because we found from right-hand rule, then r, which is L, and then the force of gravity, mg, and then the angle between these two, which is whatever our angle is. So sine of theta. So now we have negative L mg sine theta. Our moment of inertia, this is just a single point mass, so we can just do mr squared or ml squared for our pendulum, and that is our sum of our torques over the moment of inertia, and this is then equal to alpha, which is our second derivative of the angle with respect to time. So we can do a little bit of cancellation here. We've got an L on top, L on bottom, mass on top, mass on bottom. And we can move this d squared d theta, dt squared over to this side, and we get negative g over L sine theta. So if we want, this is our exact solution. But let's take a look at write our simple harmonic motion condition.
That condition says a second derivative with respect to s, dt squared is equal to negative omega squared s. So for us, this would be the second derivative of theta, right? That's what we have dt squared equals negative omega squared theta. This is looking pretty close, right? We have here, we have the negative, we have some constant omega squared, but this sine theta and this theta don't exactly match. But they could look a lot, lot better. So if you are in integral calculus, if you are in your series class in calculus, you might have heard of Taylor series. Taylor series is that we can represent a lot of different function as a finite or infinite sum of polynomials. So for sine, we found this representation. We can write sine theta as equal to theta minus theta to the third over three factorial plus theta to the fifth over five factorial minus theta to the seventh over seven factorial and so on and so forth, right? With nines, with elevens and things like that. So what we might notice is if we know the factorial series, this factorial jumps up absolutely hugely very, very quickly, right? This three factorial is six, this five factorial is 120, this seven factorial is well over a thousand. So this bottom part grows, and if our theta is less than one, then this part is actually gonna get smaller and smaller. So we're gonna actually make an even stronger assertion, if we say our theta is much, much less than one, then theta is gonna be larger than, and in fact, much, much larger than theta to the third over three factorial. Theta is gonna be much, much larger than theta to the fifth over five factorial. And we can keep making these arguments. That if we are dividing by these exceedingly large numbers and we're taking a number less than one, to a higher power, which makes it even smaller, then only this number is gonna count as opposed to these other ones. So what we call this is we call this a linear approximation. We are gonna say for theta much, much less than one, that sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. Now, how good is this approximation? So this mostly kind of taps out around 20 degrees, but we'll say at 20 degrees, which is equal to pi divided by nine, sine of pi divided by nine is 2% off from pi over nine. And then below, 20 degrees, then we have a better approximation. So if our angle is 20 degrees or less, then sine theta being roughly equal to theta is 2% or better of, 2% or better um, in terms of how far they are off. A lot better than a lot of our labs, a lot better than a lot of other approximations. It's pretty good. So if we have this linear approximation, then we can say d squared theta dt squared is equal to negative g over l theta, right? We're using this linear approximation, and this gives the solution then our simple harmonic motion condition is that then the solution is S as a function of t is s max times cosine of omega t plus phi. So in this case then, our solution is gonna be theta of t is equal to theta max cosine of omega t plus phi. And we know that this g over l is equal to omega squared. So we get from this that omega is the square root of G over L. So then, right, if we can use this approximation, if we are not swinging it overly wildly from very, very large angles like that, 
then, right, we have simple harmonic motion. If we have it from small enough angles, we are nice and well within simple harmonic motion.